Long ago, two Viking marauders captured a lonely nun called Ozith, and they chopped her head off. But they say she then picked up her head, carried it back to her nunnery, and died there. And this miraculous act of martyrdom earned her a sainthood, and the pilgrims flocked in, and the local village adopted her name and prospered. Well, that's the story. This little town on the Essex coast is still called St Ozith, but its real origins are a mystery, and the locals have called in Time Team to help them find out when and where their town really began. They also want to know if these ancient timbers sticking out of the nearby creek fit into the story. Could they possibly hold the key to the mystery of St Ozith? We and the locals have got just three days to find out. We begin our quest for the origins of this town on the waterfront. Geophys are testing a peculiar lump between the timbers and the shore. If there's a significant feature here, then these timbers might possibly be a missing link in St Ozith's evolution. But the mud isn't going to give up its secrets that easily. There's a rich trading history on this part of the Essex coast, and St Ozith, just five miles from the ancient city of Colchester, is proud to have been a small port since the Norman times. Today, the town's set back from the scattered creeks and marshes and clustered around a huge 12th century priory. There's still a small harbour at the head of the creek, but at the time the Priory was built, this waterfront might have looked very different. Alan, this is a heck of a place you've brought us to. Poor old Phil can't get within ten yards of where he's supposed to be digging. It's going to take Richard another half hour to lay out the duck boards for us. When did you first notice that there was something here? It was about ten years ago, sailing up and down the creek. And when the tide was barely in, these stakes kept appearing. And I couldn't tie them in with anything natural. And so, no, why were they there? Who put them there? So what did you think it was? Well, at that stage, I suppose it took a few weeks to sink in there's possibly a key. A key? A key that you tie boats That's to. right, yes. Mm -hmm. But all the boats are way over in that direction, are they? Yes, now. <laughs> <laughs> so does that rather undermine the theory? No, I don't think it does. I mean, it's on the outer bend of a river. They might put timbers in to stop erosion and be able to tie boats. That's where the deeper water is. But there's a whole load of other things it could be. It could be part of a fish weir for catching, you know, fish coming in or out. Or it could just be a revetment for this bank. Phil! You found anything yet? Yeah, I've got some pottery here, Tony. There are ten minutes, and he's already found some finds. <laughs> Before we arrived, Alan discovered loads of pottery in the field behind the creek. Mix asked a few of the locals to field walk this area to see if they can discover any finds that might link this field with our timbers. Field walking isn't easy with a young crop in the ground. Phil, you're the only one of us who's seen this thing close up so far. What do you mean he's the only one? Oh, so I forgot the mud prints. <laughs> I thought you didn't do mud. I wish we hadn't, to be Why honest. Why not? Well, look, we've got the edge of the bank there. That's the vegetation. There's the creek. There are the timbers. We, we have got this sort of gravel bank linked with it. But isn't that what we can see with this lump in front of us anyway, John? Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, right. So all your wading around hasn't really come uh, to much fruition? Not a lot. What do you reckon this is? I still think it's something just like a fish trap. Oh, John, stop being so negative. I mean, look at the way it's constructed. It's really substantial. There's all those big timbers down there and there's other ones laid on edge over there. Why can't it be just something more like a wharf with an access way here? I think that's quite feasible. Raksha, what's your instinct? I think it's something much more substantial because the timbers are running back up to the bank. So I don't see why it can't be something like a mill. 
Do you buy a mill? Yeah, he could be. He could be, or he could be a revetment for the side of the river. There's all sorts well, of Well, either way, arguing about it now isn't actually going to resolve it. I'll tell you where we're going to put the trench. We're going to pull the muck away from the timbers in front there to see what the construction is. Then we're going to see whether or not those timbers do extend into the bank, as Raksha thinks they might do. And then also we'll see the construction of the causeway as well. He's yeah. telling you what to do. You're the boss. No, but he's right. With That's the way we've got to dig it, because we've got to work with the tide here. We've got to work low down until we're driven off by the rising water. I mean, that's what you seem to have forgotten. We haven't got three days. We've only got three tides. But low tides at midday, Phil. Oh, look, Tony, but by halfway through the afternoon, it's going to be halfway up, which is actually going to cover the base of our stakes. So we've got a fish trap or a revetment or a key or a mill... And we've got just three tides to dig it. That's right. Come on, Raksha, let's get at it. (laughs) (laughs) The history of this place is rather vague. After the legendary martyrdom of St Osith in the 7th century, the first record we have is Doomsday, which tells us that 70 souls were living here by 1086. In 1121, work began on a huge priory dedicated to St Osith, and it's likely a medieval town would have sprung up around the Priory. But we don't know that. It's a funny-shaped town, this, isn't it? It is. It's not like what you'd expect for a medieval town at all. What would you expect? Well, normally you get a sort of triangular or rectangular marketplace, and you get these very regular patterns of narrow properties around it, so that even from the map you can see where the town was. You don't have to sort of look at the buildings and ask where it was. But here, you look at the map and you can't see much at all, can you? No, I mean, we're standing just here. um, And if you look over your shoulder that way, there's the Priory. And the church, which is marked on the map here, is just there. And, you know, there's a triangular area here, which, as Mick says, is your classic marketplace, perhaps. But there's no sign of these long, narrow, sort of urban properties that you'd expect at all. If you look at this row here... You know, it's tiny little places. They're places that started as market stalls, temporary, and they've gradually got fixed, so there they are, and they've filled all the space up. Not many gardens here. Our task is to establish where the early town of St Osith was at the time the Priory was built. Carenza will mastermind the hunt for the medieval town, so Matt and Bridget and the locals are going to sink lots of test pits to see if there are signs of occupation. In the garden of the Red Lion pub, Matt's looking for rubbish pits at the back of some of the early properties. These might contain the remains of domestic pottery. You see that? There's a bit of a brick there or something, so that's a piece of a brick or tile. So there's there's evidence that that, people have been living and doing stuff here already. There are two test pits behind the butcher's house. This Victorian wall might have been the frontage for small market stalls. Buildings like each side of the alleyway come to here, there's a gap. So um, there must have been something here once. But we're not just digging. Carenza and buildings historian Brenda Watkin will be trying to put a date on the oldest houses by identifying medieval architectural features and by dendrochronology, dating wood by taking core samples from the oldest structural timbers. The rivers are the waterways of the time. They're the railways and the motorways. Um, A town like this, the foreshore in front of it would have been covered in small vessels. Everyone would have... More people would have boats and horses and carts, so you can see a lot of vessels would be here. Most vessels can just be pulled up on the foreshore. You don't actually need a major facility. So what do we mean when we say it would have been a quay? What you've got there is a very interesting, unusual structure, which is actually projecting out into the river, or appears to be projecting out into the river. Now, that is an anomaly. But not necessarily a quay? Not necessarily key as we know it, but clearly something unusual, something out of the ordinary on the riverbank. And because that is out of the ordinary, that's why we have to dig it. We don't understand it yet. In addition to our test pits, we're digging here, at one of the earliest properties in St Osith. It looks like a wealthy merchant's house, and we think there could have been craftsmen's workshops at the back. Okay. You can start troweling on this and see if you can see anything you think's man-made. You've got a little tray... Stacks of finds, but nothing early enough to prove our town started here. 
So what dates the building then? Well, the building apparently dates from about the 1300s, the earliest bit, but that's from an architectural survey done before, so I think we ought to get our expert to have a look at it. Yeah, but it, it does mean we should find that sort of thing in the garden. We should do, and hopefully we'll be out beyond the edge of the medieval house and yeah. into the garden area where we might find rubbish from, you know, rubbish pits or yeah. boundaries or anything like that. So we're optimistic. Ah, oh, that's a piece of stoneware. That's quite interesting. This is um, a kind of pottery that comes into into Britain probably from the 16th century is the earliest stuff from, from cool. Europe. So that could be an early date, but there's just not enough of it to be able to say. Yeah, that's nice. Cool. And the butchers mats off at a cracking pace. So it's quite a bit higher, isn't it, the ground surface here? So you must have had a lot to go through. Yeah, yeah, we have. The road is actually a bit higher on that side as well. The whole thing, I thought, oh, slowed down. <laughs> But it turns out that most of this here is actually, there's a huge amount of topsoil in here being brought in. However, about a metre down, the top of there, you can see what is quite crude wall structure. Just right, We've just managed to catch the edge of it there, so it's pretty luckily placed. That and it's medieval. It's block built and there's yeah. flint in it. That looks very much like some of the other medieval walls. So Among the plethora of finds... Pretty sure it's medieval. Oh, that's fantastic. I think that's our first bit of yeah. medieval. So there's some sort of later medieval settlement up here, but do finds like this tell us the town grew up around the new priory? The tide has turned in the creek. In a couple of hours, the timbers will be completely submerged. Phil's cleared the mud from the bottom of the timbers and has found tool marks where the stakes have been sharpened. At this stage, it's impossible to tell how old the wooden structure is or what it is. To the side of the timbers, there's a steep slipway. Phil's found a layer of gravel mixed up with river mud sitting on top of a curving outcrop of clay. This looks like the bottom of the creek bank. There's the gravel. There's stacks of pottery in amongst the deposits. So if that doesn't date it, nothing will. Right opposite the old marketplace, Brenda, our buildings expert, has been doing some detective work. This house looks classically Victorian on the outside, but inside... Oh, goodness. Wow, immediately you've got... Yes, see, immediately we've got a moulded bridging joist. And just up the stairs, there's the critical clue. So here we've got... A joist cut out. Here is the soffit tenon, which has been cut off but is still in place. And above it, the diminished haunch. Right, and what's that telling you? That's telling me that that's a joist joint that's coming in in the early 1500s. Mmm, a diminished haunch. We've got our first reliable date for this part of the town. But it's not medieval. It's 400 years later than the founding of the Priory. All the pits in the town are producing stacks of good finds. Yeah, ah, it's ah. More, <laughs> that is more quite of that useful. Slip, is that the slip, same slipware? That looks potentially medieval. Yeah, absolutely, I'd say. Whether they're the right date remains to be seen. Yeah, it's been knocked around a bit. Tea time day one, and we've already put two test pits in the garden of the old house, two in the pub, two in the butcher's shop, one in another house vaguely in that direction, and we've hardly started yet. Why are we looking in the graveyard? Well, because this is the next space that we can get right into the very end of this marketplace, right at the edge of it, and it's the only open area. And are you really happy for us to dig here? Oh, absolutely. That's fine. Are there any rules? Yes, as long as it's on the unconsecrated land. Which is where? Well, it's clearly marked. Look at the boundary here. It follows this line. This side, we've got individual graves within the consecrated ground. And as you move outside, you can see a massive change in all these strong resistance anomalies suggesting maybe cobbled courtyards, building rubble, whatever, but stretching right back from the road. And where are we going to dig? Just about there. Which is where? Um, clue? Yeah, pretty good clue. By the time Ian's got the turf off, we'll have to pack it up for the day. We also hear the vicar's a bit of an archaeologist. He's dug here before. There was one over by that red brick wall, very ancient wall there, and one behind us here, and one directly behind you over there. Uh, and what did they find? They found evidence that supported what we thought was the case, that there was an old stable yard surrounded by buildings here in the past.
Well, as you can see, things are pretty much ground to a halt here because it's the end of tide one. Even Phil's decided to come on out of the water. <laughs> <God> <laughs> have, <yeah. laughs> have you come up with anything? We've been absolutely inundated with results. It's been brilliant. I mean, we're stood along here now. All this is covered in water. But what you saw this morning was this L shaped of timbers coming round there. And our causeway, which is all this muck in front of us, is actually along there. Well, what we've actually been able to find is that the causeway is supported by this revetment, which is wattle lined. And then along here, we've actually got this artificial cut. Now I reckon that is pointing towards a wharf. Do you reckon that knocks all the other theories on the head? I think it's unlikely we've got something as massive as a mill now because the timbers aren't that big but this could still be you know part of a fish weir that's reused something like that. I mean we want to still resolve it tomorrow we're going to explore and actually join up yeah. with the other side of it over here. And are all these finds from your trench? It is amazing I mean my wharf as I like to call it has produced all this magnificent amounts of pottery and, and bone loads and loads of roof tile, roof tile and we've yeah. actually got some leather as well. And this isn't all we've got, is it? It's been a regular cornucopia up in the village. We've had all this stuff from the field walking, or that's come out of the test pits, or these bits have come out of the test pits. So what does it all mean? Well, our finds experts will tell us when they get here tomorrow. Beginning of day two in our search for early St. Osith. Hey, up, haven't you got a trench to go to? I'm not going to walk past this. Isn't it? It's just beautiful. Look at the quality of the craftsmanship. Look, every flint of that has been shaped up, squared, and then laid. Look, barely get your thumbnail in there. Absolutely magnificent. Craftsmanship, Tony, craftsmanship. That's what that is. <laughs> this magnificent gatehouse was added to the priory in the 15th century, the same date as most of the pottery that we're finding in the town. But our task is to discover what sort of place this was at the time the Priory was built. This morning, this lovely old photo came to light. It's from about 1900, and that church is this church here, except it's the other side. So can you see those buildings there? They would all have been here and here and here and here and here. Why do you reckon there would have been all these little buildings slap bang in front of a church? It's not unknown in, in medieval towns to have rows of little shops, little workshops, you know, with a stall out the front, plonked along the edge of churchyards like this. And it seems to be speculative development to make a bit of extra rent. But the thing we really need to know is what date were those buildings first started to encroach on the marketplace, and that's really starting to pull together the history of medieval St. Osef. How do we get the date? Well, I think it would be very useful to dig, dig somewhere where those buildings are on the photograph to see if they do start as, you know, speculative shops in the Middle Ages. So, do you mean that we go back in here and sort of stick test pits round here somewhere? Yeah, I mean, this building here could be the end survivor of a whole row. This big one? What about this? Yeah, and then the, on that's here. the end of one that stood in here, just, just stuck on the end there. I mean, the brilliant thing is we've got an open area right in the middle of our marketplace that we can actually investigate. I reckon a cheap bottle of wine, it will be 15th century. <laughs> I hope it's not, because she won't touch cheap wine. <laughs> As the vicar predicted, we found Victorian rubble. But we've still got to go 500 years further back. Down on the creek, the second tide is on the way out. But something's gone horribly wrong. Hey, up, Phil. You don't look like your normal cheery self. Is it surprising? Look, well, I mean, this last night was my trench, wasn't it? Yeah. Look at it now. What's happened? Well, the tide came in, didn't it? Well, you must have expected <laughs> that. You were the one who said to me this is about in, out, in, out, in, out over three days. Yes. Yeah, but we didn't actually expect it to come in this, this, this hole. I mean, I was reliably informed this was going to be a neap tide, and apparently neap tides mean that it don't, they don't come in as, as hoey. But look, it's just inundated everything. It's a mess. So what are you going to do, Raksha? Well, there isn't anything that we can do, really. We just have to clean it up and start all over again. It's a bit of a waste of time, though, isn't it? No, it's not a waste of time. There's no point in doing it until you, unless you get it cleaned up and recorded it. We, we, we've got to do that. Do a hand? I'm glad he's deaf as a post. In our incident room, Paul Blinkhorn has confirmed that the pottery found by Phil at the Creeks no earlier than the stuff we're finding in the town. But the finds from the field walking behind the creek are much earlier. 
just about every grid square is producing sherds of medieval pottery, 12th, yes. 13th century. Cool. Yeah. So this is where the early stuff's coming yeah, from? Yeah, the earliest stuff I've seen so far is all from the field walking. It's all local wares. Um, there was medieval pottery kilns just north of Colchester, yeah. uh, producing grey sandy wares in the 12th and 13th century, and this is what we're getting. Um, even this bit with a bit of green glaze, a bit of slip on it, might have come up from London, possibly. Right. Um, but... There's one... It's grubby stuff, isn't it? It's quite nasty, that <laughs> bit, actually. It's quite crude. There's one outside possibility that this thing might be Saxo-Norman. Oh, come on, Paul. How can you tell that? The fabric. I mean, it's a very, very battered uh, shirt, but um, there was a lot of very high-quality pottery being made in East Anglia in the yeah. late Saxon period, the Thetford wares. Well, this obviously isn't it. <laughs> that might be a bit of Thetford wear. It's very right. beaten up and it's very battered, but yeah. the fabric's a little bit different to the other stuff. It seems to be slightly finer. But anyway, getting back towards the Norman Conquest with this stuff... Yeah, we're talking 1050, and, and then possibly a little bit earlier. early Middle Ages for, for, for this. It's consistently 12th and 13th century, the background noise. Well, that's all very interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it looks as if the, the, the jetty where Phil is is similar sort of date to what's going on in the town. And the early stuff is actually in the field at the back. Mm. That's confusing. The timbers by the creek are 16th century and there's no sign of any settlement around the Priory before the 15th century. So much for the planned medieval town. The stuff that's remotely contemporary with the start of the Priory is a mile away in a wheat field behind the creek. Make sure that the only way of explaining this conundrum and seeing what, if anything, was going on down there is to send in geophys. The historical documents tell us that early St Osith was full of tradesmen who could have serviced a growing priory town, including the usual suspects, carpenters, potters, brewers. Well, there are one or two with rather more unusual names. Um, there's a chancellor who might be a court official or usher, and there's a man who's possibly a gauger. What's that? Um, a type of customs official or excise man. So does that imply that there was quite a lot of money around? I think, yeah, one could expect there to be a number of merchants and another man's called a chapman, which is a sort of petty trader or merchant. What sort of population would there have been? Well, our best evidence comes from the late 14th century and the poll tax, and that implies a population of perhaps five to 600 people. In the 16th century, would there have been the same kind of merchants and sellers around here? Oh, very much so, I think. But we've actually got the record of a far greater range of trades at that time. So we've got a, a tanner, a glover, uh, a butcher, um, uh, a weaver. Um, so great, great variety. Uh, anybody to do with the harbour? Yeah, very much so. There's record of five mariners and a shipwright. So clearly boats were being built here in the early 16th century. Hey, Phil, it's getting more and more precarious down here. The more people use your duck boards. Oh, come on, stop making a fuss. Oh, you've cheered up now, haven't you? You should have seen him this morning. He's giving me a lot of stick for coming down here as well. We've had real fun down here this morning. We've got a dock. What do you mean by dock? What you're looking at is a place where a boat would have, would have slipped in through there. Do you see this, this big area of clay? It's all that... a big area of clay. No, no. <laughs> You want me to get over there and show you, don't you? <laughs> Look at the yellow underneath. That's the oh, clue. Blimey. Oh, blimey, this Phil, stuff here, it. that's yeah. the actual natural. And it comes way across there and goes up the other side. And in the middle of it is this great big dollop of grey clay. So the boat is going to fit into there. It's going to be protected on this side by these timbers. And we've got along there uh, a load of wattle that actually the boat would have slipped up against. And beyond that, we've got our gravel causeway, which is where you would have unloaded and offloaded the boat. And the actual front of that causeway is supported by a, a wattle fence. Now, when that wattle fence actually rotted, all this gravel, which is part of the causeway, collapsed and fell into the dock. And on that side, we've actually got uh, another wooden frontage, which is comprising of boards, but in the front of that is also wattle-lined. Can we dendrodate this wood? No, we can't. I mean, unfortunately, the, the timbers, I think they need about 50 rings yeah. or something like that. The, tim the timbers are just not big enough to actually be able to get a date. But, you know, there's, there's an awful lot we can get out of this, isn't there, with the, with the timbers and everything you've got? It's a question of whether I can get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one big question, though, when was it? Ah, yeah, well, we, we, I think we know that now because Paul's gone through the pottery that Phil found up on the top there and it's a closely datable group. 
He's got one lot of stuff that's about 1600 to 1650, and the rest of it's post 1650. So we're looking at a 17th century dock. That's good. I mean, I've been here all morning. I haven't got the foggiest <laughs> idea how old it was. Shame it's not medieval. Now, see if we can find us a medieval key. <laughs> Do you want a hand out or you're all right? No, nah, he's all right. Thank, Thank you, you, friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't pull. Don't pull, you silly old fool. <laughs> John's already got the geophysics results. John, you can't have geophysed this entire field. Well, we've done a pretty big chunk to start with. Uh, it looks pretty busy, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's anomalies right along the river frontage. I mean, that's where Phil's trench is in there. And there's these responses. Cool, blimey. Is that geophysics? Oh, that's good, isn't it? It's How does that tie in with the field walking? Well, we've just got it plotted out. Look, I think it's the same area as yours. It's the so same grid. And, and there's medieval pottery in every square. Yeah. Phil? See that? Good Lord, not meaningful geophysics <laughs> results for a change. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Looking at that, where do you think that we should now do it? Hey, no, no, just well, a minute. You chose where a... we dug on day one. Well, you haven't given me a chance. <laughs> well, tough. We're going to put a trench in in there, in amongst all that noise, and that's where we got quite a bit of the pottery. Right. Yeah, Where's that on the ground? Can you see that sort of 12 foot tall cane over there? Yeah. Well, that's where we, we've got the really nice anomalies, and that's where quite a bit of the pottery came from. Yeah. So um, do we are going to dig there, you're going to join us. Oh no, you're going to dig there. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd, I'd actually, we must look at that first, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. But I, I think these could be industrial type responses. So what are you thinking of something the back of the river, the all sort of, of workshops, activity. boat yards. I mean, it could be like a small hive, couldn't it? Boat building, boat breaking, boat repairing, and a whole load of activity. Fantastic here. if we found a lot of industry in here. Well, it? we've got more medieval pottery here than anywhere else. It's very difficult to explain the huge gap in time between the waterfront, where Phil's finds were 16th century, and the field behind. You feel like one of these sort of GM, GM vandals. <laughs> 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 no, you need a black mask over your head. <laughs> Ooh, what? Slag. Really? Isn't it? Oh, dear. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Flint. <laughs> Stick to Jiff, is it, John? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> We know from the poll tax that people were living in St Osith in the 14th century. Might be the remains of one of your windows there, Martin. <laughs> Not that deep. <laughs> but none of our test pits have produced any finds at all to prove the town was here. I think that's a bit of pottery, Mark. You're getting earlier. There's a, quite a lot of the 15th century stuff. Oh, right. But you've got this. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is a find of the day. It's the first thing we found that's that's earlier than the 15th century in the in the town itself. Oh, brilliant. I mean, I presume looking at your trench, you're still in topsoil, are you? We're just coming off the topsoil down onto another layer with cobbles in it, but it's not making a lot of sense yet. But it's okay. definitely archaeology. Well, it, I mean, looking at the finds you're getting coming up, it's looks likely to be 15th century. Everything else I've seen today in the town has been. But this bit, I mean, shows at least that there are Saxons around here somewhere. I mean, yes, we've got an earlier find, but is it too early? This pit doesn't look deep enough. By now, pretty well all of our test pits have hit the bottom, and there's still a horrible gap of 300 years between the founding of the Priory in 1121 and our 15th century finds in the town. What do you think is going on, Matt? Well, the only explanation really is that we're in the wrong place and the, the centre of medieval St Osef is not actually here on this side of the Priory. Do you think that's right? I don't think it was here at all. I think we've got the Priory over there, we've got the um, harbour, the creek over there. If you're going to do a town, you're going to put your settlement near those things, so that's going to be pushing it over the other side of the Priory, plus an old house here. This is the oldest recorded building, 1300s, absolutely no medieval whatsoever. The features suggest agriculture, so this could just be a farmstead with the settlement over there. Paul, I have to say, that isn't the noises that Mick and Carenza were coming out with this morning. Well, it might not be, but whenever I've seen pottery assemblages from a medieval town or, or settlement of any size, you invariably find lots of early medieval pottery mixed up in the late medieval and early post-medieval deposits. That just isn't happening here. There's not one single scrap of medieval pottery before the 15th century, apart from one church of Saxon. If I, looking at this, I can't see how there could be any medieval archaeology here before the 15th century. It just doesn't look right. It just doesn't look as if there is any. 
Carenza's not happy. There's absolutely no sign of an early St Osith springing up around the Priory during its first 300 years. No, I mean, we would have expected to find more 12th and 13th century pottery, I think, in the buildings around that open space of the marketplace. And I do find that odd. You know, it doesn't look as if this has got a built-up series of properties around this marketplace by, say, the 12th and 13th centuries. Come on, that is a problem. Well, it may be that the marketplace was bigger than we thought. Sometimes they're an awful lot bigger before they get infilled. We've got a building of 1500 here that's built up against buildings that are already in existence. We've got one of 1350 here. And we've got Saxon pottery turning up in the churchyard. There seems to be an early focus on well, one shirt. the church. I mean, I think it's odd that all the points that you're making there, they're all late. You know, you're talking about a 15th century building here, a 14th century building here. Where's the 12th and 13th but we century stuff? We've only dug small test pits. We, we, it would I show still up. think we've got time. It would show up. Okay, so where is the 12th well, and 13th century? All the 12th and 13th century pottery is down by the edge of the river. So I think one possibility must be that it is down there and that this is later. I mean, certainly what we don't have is a regularly planned market town no. laid out by the Priory. We, is this sort of DIY town? We wouldn't be in this we... mess if we got a proper planned town, <laughs> would we? OK, really? so the big question is, is the medieval town by the church? Is it to the north? Is it down by the harbour? Is it just a higgledy-piggledy town that hasn't got a centre? Or is well, it somewhere it got... else? <laughs> Absolutely. Or are there several marketplaces? <laughs> Let's find out tomorrow. Two days ago, we came here to the Essex coast to try and find the medieval origins of the town of St Osith. And have we found them? No, we haven't. We've dug hole after hole in the present day town and come up with nothing at all that's earlier than late medieval. So with just one day left, Mix decided to throw virtually all our resources into this field next to the creek. Why here, Mick? Because the field walking here produced the earliest pottery from St Osith that we've got so far. You know, the, the large collections of 12th and 13th century stuff came from across this slope here. We've also put the geophysics in here, which has got a great swathe at the bottom of this field, just above the creek, in fact, just above where Phil was digging. And John tells me that a lot of this indicates settlement activity. Some of it is probably industrial activity as well. OK, so what are we going to do? Well, it's a big area to deal with. And uh, we've only got one day to deal with it. So what we thought we'd do is dig some long trenches with a machine. I say long trenches, perhaps five by one, something like that. Clean them up and see what's in there. And that will give us a sample across quite a large area to see whether we've actually got structures and whether we've got more finds. But why here, so far away from the present day town? Well, it's probably something to do with the fact that there's a port or, or, or trading going on in the river. And it's not unusual, of course, for places to move about. You know, we, we tend to think of towns as static and villages as static. But over a period of 1,500, 2,000 years, they do move about as their fortunes and economic change. So it doesn't surprise me that they might have lived down here at one stage, a lot of trading going on. They may have lived up by the Priory when that was in existence, servicing that, lived round the town, you know, service in a market which is supplying the local area at another time and the fortunes of these places are changing from time to time. So I'm quite confident we're going to get something here at the moment. He's written a book on that. <laughs> Still available as well. John Geofiz has pinpointed a number of big anomalies and no sooner can Henry confirm the position than a new trench is born. Everyone's getting stuck in. Excellent. To your level. By lunchtime, we should know if mixed dig or bus strategy has paid off. Gus, our harbour expert, is examining the timbers in Phil's dock. Hopefully, he can tell us if the structure related to the town or the field behind, or both. Most of the town trenches have shut down, as after two days there's no tangible evidence of a settlement earlier than the 15th century. But Martin the vicar isn't giving up. Looking good. Back by the creek, Mick's gamble hinges on the geophysics. And quite understandably, John's a little nervous. It's kind of, we're losing it here, we'll have to clean this back a bit. And there's this massive great blob here, so I'm wondering if we've got a couple of intercut rubbish pits or something. It's domestic. Rubbish, it's tile, it's shell, bits of pottery. One shirt is 12th century, really? definitely, yeah. Maybe slightly earlier, it could be Saxo Norman. Oh, I think that's a big thing. Um, I think you got it right, John. Do you want that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish pits could mean houses. John's identified seven anomalies. 
So Paul's here, Phil's here, and Raksha's finds suggest there was shipbuilding here. You seem to have found your anomalies. There's lots of metal and nails and things. That's all within this pit. That's all within this pit. So you did well on your geophysics this time then, John. Keep saying that. <laughs> I'm on a victory tour at the moment. A, a what? A victory tour. Victory tour. Well, if you're in so victorious a mood, what have you got on your printout for this? This is actually the anomaly. It's one of the strongest we've got. Okay. I mean, it looks like a uh, fired brick. I wonder whether it's not a furnace, a, uh, a, a smithy. Ah, oh, well, that would be... Because... That would be... Because... Oh. Look what I'm getting. Lots of clinker and stuff like that, masses of it. And that and it's isn't all, flint, it, is it? it <laughs> no, John, that's not Flint. But it's all its all coming in here. Just as we predicted. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> in the river, we thought we'd got a 17th century dock. But Gus has got other ideas. These piles are not straight. They're all twisted at various angles. That one over there is seriously twisted. These ones here, if I may just wade into the water... Uh, this one here, I've actually got the bottom of. You can see it's got this nice, sh nice chamfer on the bottom there, which means these piles were driven in at about that height. So only that metre or so was actually standing proud of whatever river level was there then. We've lost all the front half, and you can see that over there. You can see where that broken plank is. You can see very clearly that we've lost the front half of the structure. So Alan is actually standing on the front of the structure. He is the riverfront... This is the middle of the riverfront. We're in the middle of uh, a waterfront feature. What about dating? Well, the dating seems to have come, all that pottery you're talking about, seems to have come from the bottom of these erosion levels. OK? So that pottery dates the erosion of the feature, the demise of this structure, the collapse of the front, not its construction. So we know when it ended and we know how it ended, but what we don't know is when it was built and what it really looked like and what it was for. Gus, basically, you're telling me that yesterday evening we had a nice little story, a beginning and a middle and an end, about what this wood was, and now you're kicking the whole thing wide open again. That's right. Thanks, mate. <laughs> no problems. But at least this enigmatic structure could be a lot older and could tie up with the story of St Osith. Carenza has finally accepted that there is no earlier town up here, but she's trying to find out what it was like in the 15th century when the priory was powerful and the town was probably booming. Yesterday, Brenda found a place that didn't look significant at first, but its location is crucial on the corner of the old marketplace. Brenda's sure that it was a public building as both floors were originally open plan, but she needed confirmation of its age. Martin, have you managed to get a dendro date off this medieval public building we've discovered? Yes, I have. We've been quite lucky. Oh, brilliant. We've got a lot of sat wood, and adding in the sat wood that might be missing because we've got no bark takes us 1494 to 1500. Brenda, that's pretty much exactly what you said. Yes, it's very, very close to what I said. I would have liked it a little bit later, but... Well, the trees tell the <laughs> truth. Classic site for a guild hall, Chris. Do you think it was a guild hall? Have we got any historical evidence for a guild? Yes, well, we've got a good tie-up with the documentary evidence oh, because in the 1524 taxation, the um, guild was recorded paying a tax on its possession. So, so this tells us that St Osith was a small booming town with thriving guilds at the beginning of the 16th century. Sadly, this was probably the peak of its prosperity, as the fortunes of St Osith waned after Henry VIII dissolved the priory 50 years later. So have we got any tool marks on these timbers, Gus? Yes, um, yes we have, Mick. You can just see the striations, that the, the bottom of the axe cuts. When the light's right... Oh, yeah, if I get down, I can out. see there. Yeah. Like, so what, is, what do they tell us? Well, there's definitely an, an iron-bladed axe. It's not Bronze Age. Oh, that's good. Be, I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> and it's not Stone Age. Right. So it is in the era of um, before mechanical tools. But right, so we've right. had um, quite a major... Trauma. Well, what sort of thing are you thinking of? Well, what I mean by that is this is a well-built structure yeah. which, which kept the riverfront robustly safe with most high tides, but there has been an exceptional storm surge which has simply wiped out 
the entire front of this structure. Right, in which case you'll find this interesting. This is Samuel Pepys writing in his diary, yeah. 7th of December, 1663. So it's right for what you're oh. telling me about the yeah. period. He says, at Whitehall I hear and find that there was last night the greatest tide that was ever seen in England to have been in this river, all Whitehall having been drowned. I mean, that does sound like a big event just down the coast, doesn't it? Well, given that the, the pottery that was in that erosion scour was mid to late, was, was that 1650 to 1700? That, it's 1663 what... between 1650 and 1700. Yeah. <laughs> it must be the flood then. Well, Samuel Pepys was right. I'm always a bit wary about one event causing something, but clearly, you know, damaging tides like that must have happened. It was an event like that, a quite cat an unusually high catastrophic event which destabilised the structure which had otherwise served quite sensibly, quite robustly to keep most tides out. But that was just one tide too many. Yeah, amazing, amazing. With just two hours to go, the vicar's persistence has finally paid off. A metre and a half below the surface, he's produced the most important finds in the town. I can finally say you've got back before the 15th century in the medieval <laughs> period. Only <laughs> just, not. only just, but you're, you're back there before it. Right, so what have we got? That's significant? Well, we've got these three fairly small sherds, but they're enough to keep me happy. Basically, we've got this, which is a sherd of late London work, probably 14th century. We've got this, which is a sherd of early German stonework, probably about 1350. And this, which is uh, Dutch medieval pottery, the generic term for it is Ardenburg work, but again, 14th century. This is exactly the sort of thing I'd expect to see in a medieval port town. You go over to Holland, or you're coming over from Holland, you fill the hold of your boat with, with expensive goods for trade, you have a spur corner, you stick something in like a basket of pots or whatever. It's, it's not a big profit, but it's better than just wasting space. Wasted space is wasted money, as far as the merchants are concerned. So this is exactly what I'd expect to see. Yes, I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> These are terrific finds, and Paul's convinced that the wealthy end of town was up by the Priory. But there's still no proof that an earlier settlement began to develop up here at the time the Priory was built. Down at the workman's end of town, Phil has confirmed there was industry alongside the creek, but it's much later. What you've actually got is a flue. That's this dark yep. stuff, and it actually comes right the way through here. Now, it's got a wall on that side and a oh, wall on that right. side. And as the flue comes through... When it gets to here, it widens out on that side and on that side into a major chamber. That's what I'm actually standing in. Now, when we actually found it, I thought, oh, it's going to be a furnace or something like that, maybe even a smithy. But now I've actually got in it, I realise it's far more substantial than ever I, I imagined. And I think it must be a kiln or something like that. What I don't know is how old it is. How are you on bricks? <laughs> um... Well, this is a handmade brick, not, not a machine-made one. It's slightly smaller in dimensions than your average modern That's brick. That's what I thought, yeah. And it hasn't got those uh, the, the characteristic indentations. The frog. The, the, the frogs in the top, which you use for putting them in water. So that this is uh, potentially a Tudor or early Stuart brick, uh, 16th century, early 17th at tops. Could it be contemporary with our warf out there? Broadly, it is contemporary with it, yeah, I would guess. It would be a very convenient place to actually offload a barge or something like that, bringing in raw materials or maybe taking away finished products. Well, I couldn't help noticing that in your tray here, you actually have um, um, a bit of nail with a, a washer. That's the rove. This is the, um, the diamond-shaped rove that you use to clench two planks of a barge or bait together. So you couldn't sail very far on that, but provided you got the wood to go with it, that would make a nice little barge. Well, that row of hand came from a trench just over there. So, I mean, it looks like we do have boat building on the site as well. Or boat destruction, yes. This, this is a used boat rivet. Right. So, um, which means that they've had a barge and broken it up. And that presumably is undateable. Virtually, yes. But except the fact that the clinker building using th these rows uh, you know things like the M mary rose don't use these the mary rose sunk in 1545 um they went on to carvel building there so this could be earlier than the 16th century but um some ships and barges still used roads like this through to about the 17th century or so 
This morning, Mick was confident we'd find workshops and industry along the edge of this creek, and we have, roughly 16th century from the Tudor period. But the 12th and 13th century settlement of St Osyth is still as elusive as ever. In the first trench we opened yesterday afternoon, we found a cluster of mysterious rubbish pits. And now the trench is finished, Mick's delighted. We've got evidence of buildings in here. Can you see the sort of light-coloured patch across that area there? Can I get in? Yeah, yeah. When you say light-coloured patch, you mean this? That, yeah. That's, What's that? that? That's mortar, so there's, a, there's been a wall or a wattle and daub structure there. Yeah. There's a cobbled surface outside it. Look where the, the smaller stones this are. This kind of pea gritty thing. That's right, that's, yeah, not, that's yeah. not natural. And then behind you, we've got a post hole in the bottom of a trench that's going away from it that's full of oyster shells. Yeah. Uh, oysters, of course, important part of the diet then, not quite the luxury we think of today. So does that mean we've got a building? Yeah, we've got a building here. Or an oyster bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a building, you know, one of probably many that went across the site. But we've got no date. Well... Well, we have. I mean, <laughs> most of the pottery that's coming from these features is 15th century. Then we're no nearer finding the medieval than we were, are yes, we? Yes, we are, because we've got lots of residual pottery. Yeah. That's earlier pottery that's mixed in into later features. And we've got everything from the 11th century through to the 15th century. We've got the full range of medieval pottery. Not only that, we've got imported stuff. We've got things like this. Uh, that's part of a 13th century French jug. This is exactly the sort of thing we'd expect to see in an East Coast medieval port. But you see, he's got this silly grin on his face. I hadn't all... told you the best yet. Go on. We've got a major <laughs> bonus, which is this. Why is this a bonus? It's a piece of a Middle Saxon German wine jar. Is that common? It's very rare. The only sort of places you find these are in Middle Saxon ports, again, mainly on the East Coast of England. So are we saying that in the eight or nine hundred, someone in Germany was importing wine or beer or whatever right to here? Yeah, yeah, it was important enough for a German merchant to come up the creek, bringing this sort of thing with them. So given the evidence that we've got, yeah. and it's not comprehensive, is it? Are you prepared to say that we've got a Saxon settlement? Oh, I think so, yeah. We've got a complete range of the pottery. We've got structures which almost certainly go on in each direction. That's enough to show us we've got a settlement of that early medieval period. So our elusive St Osyth settlement is elusive no more. The earliest occupation started down by the river, and this would have been a busy port in Saxon times. We're sure that the mysterious timbers that Alan Williams brought us here to see were part of a dock or slipway used to load and unload cargo. But the terrible flood of 1663 would have devastated the waterfront at St Osyth and wiped out many small businesses. The shipwrights, sailmakers and blacksmiths would also have lost their houses and the old port of St Osyth would have changed forever. Ours is the story of two towns, the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. We've got in the Priory people like Brother Mick deep in prayer and <laughs> contemplation. In the Posh House we've got Lady Carenza feasting on imported pottery, looking down <laughs> on the plebs like Phil and I. <laughs> Eating ordinary people's food and Drinking trying to scratch a living. People's <laughs> beer, yeah. Down by the creek. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. <laughs>DVD, Time Team Digs, A History of Britain is out on the 10th of March. To pre-order your copy, call 0870 or click on to channel4.com slash shop. And coming up, a bit of a domestic in The Simpsons.